Hi, this is Joe Ziemba, the host of When Football Was Football here on the Sports History Network. Aside from my podcasting duties, I'm also a sports collector. And as such, I'm very pleased to share the exciting news that the Sports History Network has partnered with Rochester Sports Autographs, the largest JSA authenticated autograph distributor in the United States, where you can get deals on over 30,000 autograph sports collectibles. So as a collector, I was very pleased when I visited the site of Rochester Sports Autographs. The massive inventory is easy to search, carefully documented, and visually appealing. The options seem limitless, whether you are looking for an autographed baseball, signed football helmets, or basketball jerseys, among thousands of others. I found everything from a Babe Ruth autograph, a signed football by Dick Butkus, and an autographed Larry Bird basketball jersey. And as a collector, you'll be delighted with the very competitive pricing on JSA authenticated products. Made possible since RSA deals directly with athletes, so there's no extra markup, and the savings are passed on directly to the customer. Perhaps you're looking for an early gift for Mother's Day or Father's Day, heck, Who needs a holiday as an excuse to give a piece of sports history to your loved ones? Or how about yourself? Today seems like a great day to add to your own sports collection, right? RSA even has film, music, and other entertainment autographs on the site, so there's something for everyone. All orders from Rochester Sports Autographs are top quality and shipped to your door with top authentication and a money-back guarantee. And to make sure RSA knows that the Sports History Network sent you, we created a special link for you. All you need to do is head to shoprsa.com forward slash shn. That's shoprsa.com forward slash shn to get your own piece of sports history today. Growing up as a kid in western Pennsylvania, I loved to listen to the radio and go to ball games with my dad down at the Pittsburgh Pirates and watching the great players like Willie Stargell, Kent Tocalvi, John Candelaria, and a big right fielder named Dave Parker. We have the biographer of Dave Parker's book, Cobra, A Life of Baseball and Brotherhood, that co-wrote the book with Dave Parker. Dave Jordan is his name, and he joins us to talk about the book in just a moment. Hey, this is Darren Hayes. You've probably heard me on the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch. Well, welcome to my journey of learning more about sports history. And we're going to do it by learning about the great athletes and the uniforms that they wore as they both tell a lot about the games that we love and have watched so much throughout most of our lives. These are the chronicles I'm going to share with you on what I've learned through my journey in the Sports Jersey Dispatch. Hello, my friends of sports history. This is Darren Hayes of the Sports Jersey Dispatch Podcast. Welcome once again to the Pig Pen. And welcome to a, another great episode where we get to talk to an author about a legend in sports. And this time it's uh, the game of baseball, which we are getting ready to hit the season here in full stride. And this is one of my personal favorites of uh, when I was growing up. Uh, we're going to be talking with Dave Jordan, who wrote a book, a biography on Dave Parker, with Dave Parker. Uh, we'll bring him in right now. Uh, Dave Jordan, welcome to the pig pen. Oh, Darren, thanks for having me here. I'm very excited to uh, to hang out for a little bit. Yeah, Dave, it's uh, quite an honor to, to have you come on here and talk about this. Uh, now, your book was uh, one of the top baseball books of uh, 2021, a finalist in the, the Casey Award. So that's pretty prestigious. So. Yeah, it was very exciting to be to be part of that group. And, and it, it was interesting that there were a number of books that were part of that, that class, I suppose, that... Um, that I helped with uh, not so much the editing, but, you know, reading before they were published and whatnot and offering some guidance. So it was really, it was really a close group of of folks there. So it was nice to see that. Oh, good. So you had, you had relationships with some of the other people that had the books in there too. So. Yeah. Like like Luke Eplin with our team. Uh, He's a good friend of mine. And and it was nice for him to, when he was finishing the book, he's like, what do you think? I was like, what do you mean by, I think you're going to get nominated for a Casey. And he did. So, um, so that was nice to see. So. I wasn't filling him with some empty ambition. It was actually an amazing book, and uh, I was so so proud of of his effort there. Now, Dave, how did your uh, relationship with baseball come about? What started your fandom with the sport? Oh, Lord. My father was a Mets fan, and um, he used to take us to Shea Stadium uh, during the early 70s. And, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, actually in the mid-70s, my first game 
Um, I remember it was Tom Seaver was pitching. He won. Dave Kingman, Sky King, my, my favorite player growing up. Um, he he hit a, a long home run over the left field fence, and um, and that really had me going. And then uh, and later later that that summer, my um, my godfather tried to buy me off as a Red Sox fan. He gave me a Fred Lynn glove. And um, so I was kind of a Red Sox fan for a few years. And and my brother, who's, you know, kept, was a bit of a bandwagon jumper once the Yankees uh, rose to prominence in the mid-70s. Uh, so we had some brawls back in the late late 1970s over the Yankees and the Red Sox and whatnot. But, um, but I've always been a Mets fan at heart. Okay. Well, hey, you picked the right era because it was at the 69 Miracle Mets. Uh, so you're right, right, right before that was when yeah. that happened. Uh, yeah. Very similar to my my trek with the pirates. You know, I don't remember. I was I was born in '66, so I don't okay. really quite remember. Uh, you know, the Clemente years and that uh, those early the early '70 World Series, but I definitely remember most of the players from there, including Dave Parker and Willie Stargell and some of the greats that uh, played in those teams uh, throughout the '70s. So, uh, you know, this is, it can be a real a joy to, to talk about Dave Parker. Now, how did your relationship uh, get to be with Dave Parker? that you wrote his biography with him? Well, I, I had finished a book called uh, Fastball John with uh, John D'Aquisto, who was a Pirates fireballer in, in the uh, 1970s who hurt his, hurt his arm. And uh, that, that book had, had received some acclaim. We had done a, a reading at the, the Baseball Hall of Fame, and uh, we were cu- heading home from there when I received a phone call from a friend of mine who's who, who works with Dave Parker on um, online autographs. And... Um, and he basically said, you know, I'm hearing that the Cobra's trying to write a book and he's gone through two or three sets of writers and he's not finding the right person. And I told him that you were the guy to write his book. I said, all right, well, let me give him a call. So I gave him a call and this was probably in August of 2017. And the big man was was very upfront. He's like, I'm working with someone right now. I have a contractual agreement with them. And I said, all right, well, you know what? I've, I've knocked out a book. I've knocked out a 500 page book and I know, I know what it's going to take to get this done. Godspeed to you. Here's my number. When when you need me, call me. And then what happened was uh, about three, four months later, I found out that um, another baseball player was on his third autobiography. And, and you know what? I'll just say it here. Ron Guidry was publishing another book. And I know Yankee books sell quite well, and, and they're enormously popular. But Ron Guidry was a comparatively vanilla player for one baseball team. There's not a whole lot of drama there other than George Steinbrenner nonsense. And um, I was a little annoyed and, and I hadn't heard anything about Parker's book, which I knew was something was just explosive. So I reached out to, to the big man and I was like, Dave, what's going on with your book? Gidry, Gidry's not just writing his third book. He's about to publish his third book. And I know you have a better story than he does. And I was like, yeah, well, it fell by the wayside, this, that, and the other thing. And I said, look, you know, I'm here to help you. And if you really want, if you don't want to write a book, God bless and and best to you and your family. But if you want to write a book, I've done this before. It's not my first rodeo. I'll send you my book so you can get a look at it, what, what my book looks like. And um, and if you really want to do it, we can do it. And there's like, keep talking. <laughs> so um, the way it stood out, I mean, this is probably in, in late fall, early winter, uh, 2017. We would talk every Sunday morning from 11 till 1230. But we didn't talk about baseball. We talked about football and football is Parker's favorite sport. You know, he really? always, won. he always, and if you read Cobra, you'll, you'll see how much he loved football. And um, we would just talk about the NFL and talk about the Bengals and, and a little bit of the Steelers and whatnot. And it would basically be my Sunday foot, football Sunday pregame show was talking football <laughs> with Dave Parker. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, and we did that from probably December until the Super Bowl. And because uh, on a Sunday, he'll sit there in, in his easy chair from one o'clock till 1030 at night watching the games. Hmm. And he'll have friends over and there's food going around. And it's always football Sunday. It's a very special day at the Parker household. So um, once football season ended, we kept talking and we were done talking about football. And he was basically like, all right, you want to write something? We'll do one article. We'll do one article and we'll see how it goes. And he said, what do you want to write about? I said, what do I want? He's like, what do you want to write about? I said, I want to write about the politics of right field 
in the wake of the Clemente tragedy. And he's like, I know all about that. So we started talking about all of the moving parts of who was going to replace, you know, the departed um, Roberto in right field for the Pirates in 73. And it's in, it's a story involving Milt May, involving Sanguin, involving the, the rookie Richie Zisk, Gene Kleins, and and numerous other other minor leaguers who who never quite made it. But um, it was a, it was an article that we ended up uh, getting published in uh, Sporting News to large acclaim. And Parker started receiving all these accolades from friends and family, former teammates. Everybody loved the article. And it was it was called Brother, Brother, Brother. And um, when we were done with that, about a day or two after it was published, he said to me, all right, fine, let's write a book. <laughs> That's kind of how, how that began. You uh, cemented the deal then with just uh, showing them your work and how, how it was to work with you and the great piece that you put out there. That's a very yeah. cool, very cool story. Yeah. So Parker ended up being the right fielder, but was he the right fielder in 73? Is he the... Well, no, it would happen that the, the, the story, if you can find it online, it's pretty compelling, but, you know, not to, uh, not to spoiler alert, he got sent down. And what happened was, um, he got sent down and he, and he went to play in, um, Charleston in, in West Virginia. So he, while he was there, there was a revolving door in right field. Sanguin started the season there. He was hitting well, but he, he wanted to get back behind the plate and, um, and the Pirates ended up putting Richie Zisk in right field. He started doing very well. And then they moved him around with Gene Kleins. Gene Kleins was playing exceptionally well. And um, and he had been a, a 300 hitter the first couple of years of his career. So there were expectations that Gene Kleins was going to be an exceptional player. And then um, what happened was he hurt his knee. And Parker was called up in, um, in August. So he played... Um, he played sparingly in center field and right field, and uh, they still played Richie Zisk there. But then Parker had a hot September, so the Pirates really had had no idea what to do um, about right field. So it became a little bit of a uh, quarterback controversy there. <laughs> well, good problem to have when you have too many good players, you know. Yeah, better than the way it's been with the Pirates uh, lately, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, but the, the the funny thing that a lot of people don't remember, and in April of nineteen seventy four, around this time. Dave Parker was named the starting first baseman for the Pirates. Hmm. And he actually started in 1974. He started the first five games at first base. And um, they played the St. Louis Cardinals and the Montreal Expos. And what's interesting and fascinating about Dave Parker, the first baseman for the Pirates, is that in those five games, neither team, neither the, the Expos nor the Cardinals stole a single base. Now, if you remember your your baseball history, nineteen seventy four, who is that? That's Willie Davis. That's Larry Lentz. That's Bake McBride's rookie season. It's also Lou Brock, who stole one hundred and eighteen bases that year, and he didn't st- steal a single base while Parker was playing first. Jeez, <laughs> yeah, that's quite and, a testament. And we'll, we'll, the the biggest crazy thing was there was a um, a newspaper strike. So in Pittsburgh, there's really not a whole lot of of you know archives on Dave Parker, the first baseman, and how that went down. And ultimately, Danny Murtaugh moved Parker back to the outfield to make room for the uh, Don, uh, Bob Robertson, who was feeling a little better, who had been hurt in 73 and 74. But I think what happened was um, Parker's arm was so strong that Murtaugh looked at him and basically said, we have uh, the first baseman with the best arm in baseball. And then he and Joe Brown, the, the general manager, was like, there's a reason first basemen don't have an arm like Parker. So that's when they realize he's an outfielder. He's not a first baseman. Yeah. That, that arm was, I mean, one of the, he had many great attributes, but the, the vision that comes to my mind, I think it was like the 79 all-star game where he uh, had that throw from right field yep. at the plate to, to Gary Carter. And I forget who he put out, but it was, it was like right on the dime to, you know, they, they, I think uh, Garajola was calling the game. He gave most of the credit to, to Carter for blocking the plate. But, I mean, the, the ball never hit the ground. It, it was great. They were probably wow. six feet off the ground. It was an amazing throw. And what we talk about in the book is that the runner was Brian Downing. And, okay. uh, and Parker was, said something basically, since Downing was a catcher himself, old, old Downing should have known better, you know. <laughs> so, uh, you know, he, he has a lot of funny remarks like that in the book. 
Yeah, he he was uh, pretty incredible. That's for sure. So, okay, so he ends up getting the right field job. And at some point in time, Stargell comes out of the outfield, goes goes to first base, you know, solidifies that for, for a while. Uh, but, you know, quite a, a three, four uh, in the batting lineup for the Pirates for, for the next five, six years at least uh, with those yeah. two. There, there was, there's actually a story that goes to that as well. Uh, it was the spring of 1975, and Danny Murtaugh and, and Joe Brown were going to give Parker 500 at-bats no matter what he was doing. He was getting his 500 at-bats, and they were going to stick him in the outfield. They were trying to figure out what, what to do. Al Oliver at this point had sworn off first base. He didn't want to play first base anymore. He was an established veteran, and he wanted to just be in center field, and that's where his spot was. So there's an inner squad game, and Danny Murtaugh sticks Parker in center field. Doc Ellis is on the mound. And Doc Ellis, colorful character, everybody knows his story. And, and Al Oliver, very straight-laced gentleman. But Al Oliver and Doc Ellis had this warm relationship. They were There was a brotherhood between them. And um, and Doc always stuck up for, for, Al, for Scoop, always stuck up for him. So when he doesn't see Scoop in center field, and he, at the end of the game, you know, he goes out from the mound and walks toward the outfield. While everybody's going in for lunch, he's walking toward the outfield. And now Parker and Doc had also had a very loving relationship. Doc was something of a mentor. And as you'll, you'll read in the book, he was a, quite a mentor to, to Parker. But he goes out there and he's like, what are you doing in center field? And Parker says, Danny wants me in center. He's like, well, that's not your position. He's like, well, take it up with Danny. And he's like, if you're playing in center field, I ain't pitching. And Park was like, "Get the you know get out of my face! How you know I've been, I've worked too hard to get to this point for you to act like that. Don't be ridiculous." And then you know Doc kind of pushed him and nudged him and said, "Like who, who do you think you're talking to?" And then the Cobra just planted Doc into the ground, <laughs> and Doc looked up at, at at Parker and said, "You hit me, you die." And and Parker kind of let him go, but Doc was was still pretty sore about it and. Uh, Later that afternoon at lunch, um, Parker's eating and he looks out and he sees down on, on another field that uh, Doc in, in, is just like being very, very vocal and animated. And Willie's just standing there like this and, <laughs> and Doc's saying this and that and the other thing, yada, yada, yada. One day later, Stargill calls a press conference and announces that he's going to be playing first base. <laughs> Wow. And and, and after the, uh, the conference, he, he nudges Parker and pulls him aside and says, that was for you. <laughs> wow. That's an amazing story. I, I never heard that one. That's, that's yeah. good. Wow. And, and it's probably about time for Willie. He was getting a little, little older at that time too, a little larger and he'd been playing earlier in his career. I think so. Yeah, it was like that. And and his knees were creaking a little bit from playing on uh, playing five years on the, uh, on the artificial surface, but you know, if you look at the numbers um, and even the the uh, the sabermetric numbers for defense, Stargell was one of the better outfielders in in the game for the time that he was out there. He was he uh, he put up some very respectable numbers, and he wasn't he wasn't a liability by any stretch of the imagination. No, no, I'm not. I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying, you know, especially I'm I'm picturing you know 1979 Willie Stargell, and I, I can't picture <laughs> He's that. A little that bigger, man, yeah. yeah. I can't picture that man being in the outfield and, and center field at all or left yep. field. So, oh, great story. Now, I guess uh, I've been neglectful. I have not let you uh, say the name of your books. So why don't you go ahead and say the name of your book and oh. where people can get get their hands on it? Oh, it's it's called Cobra: A Life of Baseball and Brotherhood by Dave Parker and Dave Jordan. And it's a uh, release from the University of Nebraska Press. You can pick it up in about half the uh, Barnes and Nobles that are out there or or Amazon or the uh, the Nebraska Press uh, website. But uh, but it's readily available. Okay. And, and folks, if you're driving in the car or at the gym, don't have a pencil, we will uh, put those in the show notes as we always do of this podcast. You can uh, get a link to get right to Dave's book on Dave Parker. Dave, there's a little bit of controversy to uh, Dave Parker throughout his career. He, you know, there's some things that uh, were the ugly side of, of baseball at the time, and that mm-hmm. affected him. Maybe you could talk on those points a little bit. Well, I mean, it, it was a it was a crazy time, and part of the culture was people would go out and and sometimes they would have a couple drinks, and and sometimes they'd do some cocaine, and and Parker was. You know, he had stayed away from 
narcotics for a, a good part of his early career. And he ran into some issues down in Venezuela in 76. And just he was a little bit, not so much homesick and whatnot, but he had, he had suffered from a couple of losses, personal losses. Um, his teammate, Bob Moose, had been uh, killed in a car accident uh, in the summer, in the in the uh, postseason 1976. And then um, his beloved manager, Danny Murtaugh, had had died of a heart attack. He, he had stepped down by that point, but, you know, it was, he was still very special to Parker. He loved Dave Parker. And a lot of people don't realize how much Danny Murtaugh loved Dave Parker. And I'll give you an example. 1974, Parker was hurt maybe three or four times during the year. And Richie Zisk had a fantastic season, batted 290, 295, drove in 100 runs, you know, batted you know close to 300 against right-handed pitching. And yet, in, during the 1974 NLCS, Danny Murtaugh employed the platoon advantage and started Parker in two of the four games over Richie Zisk. Hmm. Wow. And that really told me how much – um, Danny Murtaugh was invested in uh, the success of Dave Parker. So his passing, his untimely and, and his untimely death um, really shook Parker uh, to the core. He, you know, he, he had dealt with loss in his life and, and it really, he, he, he wasn't great with it. So you know, he was at a party, a fancy, uh, you know, apartment complex. Um, a lot of the rich people and then the hoity toity of, uh, of Venezuela was there and, Someone offered him some cocaine, and he's like, you know, whatever, and and that's kind of where it began, and um, and it was very much a social thing, and you know, but the thing about Parker that I've always discovered about him is his strength and his intelligence, and you see some other ball players who got hooked on drugs, who got hooked on drugs. He never was never hooked. It. He was he was a the uh, recreational user. Sometimes some days more than others, but he was a recreational user. And then one day he decided, I'm done. And he didn't go to rehab. He didn't go to any any 12-step programs. You know, he's still the guy that can walk into a bar now and and, and have a cocktail and not, not get the shakes or anything like that. Um, but back in 1982, he decided, you know, I'm done with this. I'm growing up. Or his line is like, you know, I, I didn't have a problem with drugs. I just grew up. Hmm. Wow. Could be a lesson for a lot of us and uh, some of our our bad habits that we need to to get away from. So that's a that's no a, a very addictive one. So kudos to him for that. Yeah. So okay. So he now did you? I'm sure you had to talk quite a bit in your book about uh, the '79 uh, team, the, the family. We are family was the big song by Sister Sledge. Yep. Uh, the team really adopted that song. They, I can remember going to games as a kid that, that year they had, you know, the family over top of the dugout that the pirates sat in and, and three rivers. And, uh, they were a family and they, they, they were just a, a lovable bunch of guys, especially for, for pirates fans. And, uh, you know, Dave Parker was right there in the mix of, of guys that, uh, you know, pirates fans just love, you know, we love star Joe. We love Parker. Uh, you know, we love the pitching staff, uh, you know, and uh, how how was that locker room really? Were they really a family? Like, to well, the well, here's the thing. And I, and I kind of figured this out. The family aspect began in the late 60s when the Pirates moved to a facility in Bradenton, Florida, called Pirate City. And this facility housed basically dormitories in addition to three or four uh, practice fields. And it was one part baseball academy, one part three-star Holiday Inn. And if you weren't married, you were staying at the facility for all of spring training. And, and they were very nice. And then the thing about the book, just to you know get off for a second, is that Parker went to the Pirates and, and essentially said, give this guy whatever he needs, open the Rolodex, I want him talking to everyone. And the Pirates were fantastic. Not only did they you know, open the, um, all the contacts and all of his teammates. I spoke to maybe 75 players, coaches, coaches, managers, agents. Um, and they also gave me a tour of pirate city. So I got wow. to really go through the, the, the entire facility and, um, and have an idea of how these players got together. So Willie Stargell would be eating, uh, in 1970 or even Clemente would be eating lunch with, a guy in a ball. 
Hmm. Um, so it was really like that. And they all got together. They ate together. They slept together. They, they went out to the same bars. So the aspect of family begins in the late 60s, in late 69, or I guess spring training 68, 69, rather than 77, 78. So it, it was an aura that was around this organization for many years before the 79 season. Wow. And it was a, not just the, the major league level, you're saying all the way down through the farm system from spring training. Wow. That's, indeed. indeed. That's, and, and one of the things when you write a book about, about athletes and, and, and ball players, you find like, if you run into somebody like George Brett, George Brett has a million memories. So he's not going to remember something that, that happened on June 13th, 1975. But if you have conversations with guys who had a cup of coffee, guys who didn't even make the majors, who, whose career ended in double A, they'll remember that time they played an exhibition game against Hank Aaron. because they've told that story, you know, 10,000 times. You know, Dave Parker has 100,000 memories. Some, some guy who didn't get out of A-ball might have five. But those five are, are just, you know, right on his brain at all times. And he's able to talk about them and, and, and whatnot. So getting in touch with a 12 to 20 of those minor league players also enhanced um, the narrative of, of Cobra's book. Hmm. Now, how did he end up getting the nickname Cobra? Because I, I can remember as a kid, it was one of the, the favorite things when he would, uh, during home games, he would get up the uh, the Swami song for the India. Yeah, would, I love the Swami song. India. It would just play, and you you knew that Dave Parker was stepping in that batter's box and yeah. something good was about to happen. How, how did yeah. he get that nickname? Well, here's what happened. In, 19, in late May of 1975, um, a former uh, heavyweight boxer, Ezra Charles, had passed away. And Ezra Charles was known as the Cincinnati Cobra. And, um, you know, media circles back then, you know, Cincinnati Cobra, Cincinnati Dave Parker, Cincinnati Cobra. Bob Prince, who loved giving players nicknames, as everybody knows, um, he decided that Dave Parker was, he was the Cincinnati Cobra. <laughs> and the Pirates uh, trainer, uh, Tony Barrow, he uh, he was also a big uh, boxing fan. And he decided, yeah, here's the Cincinnati Cobra. And then Cincinnati Cobra, two weeks later, just became the Cobra. <laughs> wow. That's, that's, wow. That's the story. Yeah, you bring back fond memories of listening to the Bob Prince and, you know, Lanny for Terry and, and all the great Pirates announcers they had over, especially in that era. I, I listened to them on the radio almost every every night in the summertime. That was my nighttime ritual. My mom was, hey, get the bed, turn off the lights. And I was like that clock radio where you could set the, the timer on it and it'd always be on the, the Pirates game, you know, when they were on. I, I was right there with you with Bob Murphy and the Mets. Yeah. And, I guess all at that time it was Bob Murphy, Lindsey Nelson, and Ralph Kiner. They would switch both television and radio. And, you know, Bob Murphy put me to sleep every night. It was wonderful. <laughs> I, I shared that story a few years ago with one of my kids. And they're like, well, Dad, why didn't you just put it on TV? And I'm like, for one, we didn't have cable TV back then. <laughs> and two, you know, they weren't on they weren't on TV all the time. It was you might have like Monday night baseball or maybe a Saturday game. You know, but you got very little did you get to see, you know, in Erie, Pennsylvania, we got to see very few games on TV. Mm -hmm. You go see more at the ballparks than you could on TV. But, there, uh, maybe, maybe there was a Monday game or no Tuesday game, the Wednesday game, no Wednesday game, then it was Friday, Saturday, maybe the Sunday game. Always a Sunday game, but but for the most part, you know, not every baseball game was on television. And here's the interesting thing about Cobra. And the book, it begins, you know, we talk a lot about the party atmosphere and the family and, and good times and going to restaurants and going to bars and going to clubs and these guys hanging out like buddies and whatnot. As the book, as Parker grows older and he evolves, baseball evolves. And, free, and we talk about uh, the infancy of free agency and we talk about baseball as a business. And one of the, the lines we use in the book is that Cobra is about a game, is about a million-dollar talent just before baseball became a billion-dollar game. Mm -hmm. And we talk a lot about that and how, well, you know, to your point about not the, – the games weren't always on because you know, teams inex inexplicably believe that if the games were always on, nobody would go to the ballpark. But they didn't realize if you have the games on every night, you're going to just crush it with advertising. And they didn't really recognize that until 1983 when you started to see cable stations picking up 
rights for baseball games. And one of the soft themes of the end of the book is how broadcasting saved baseball. And we talk a lot about that. Yeah, I, I think uh, broadcasting saved many a sport. You know, we have talked about it on other podcasts about, you know, how it saved football, definitely. The you know, NFL wouldn't be the the behemoth that it is today without yep. the giant uh, television contracts and things like that. And baseball, you're right. It's, uh, you know, it's it's sort of not maybe not as popular. Football's probably overtaken as the most popular sport in yep. the United States. But, you know, it's definitely still a relevant part because – it's on TV every night during the summer. Yeah. yeah. And then that's one of the things we talk about at the end. And I'm not going to, you know, kind of uh, ruin the uh, the plot line, but I will say that at the end of the book, something happens to Parker on the same day that Major League Baseball signs a billion dollar contract with CBS. And then after that, nothing's the same. Hmm. Okay. So. Well, there, there's our teaser, everybody. Dave, let's <laughs> give them the, the name of the book once again and where they can get sure. it. It's uh, Cobra. A Life of Baseball and Brotherhood by Dave Parker and Dave Jordan. And you can find it uh, at Barnes & Noble or your nearby bookstore. You can order it. And you can also order it through Amazon or the uh, Nebraska Press uh, website. Okay. And I I have one last question for you. Okay. As a lifelong baseball fan who definitely watched Dave Parker in the era, what, what is your favorite Dave Parker moment of you as a fan? I would have to say... It's when he hits the home run in the 89 ALCS and Kelly Gruber on the Blue Jays is giving him junk in the papers and whatnot and talking about Parker. And then after he hit, as he's hitting the home run, he does this, this jog around the bases. He used to call the thing. So he does the thing and he's going around the bases and he just passes Gruber and just gives him a cocky nod and just keeps on going. And that's the Cobra. And he's just, you know, elder stage Cobra. Nevertheless, he's just fantastic. And and he's probably pushing 40 years old in in that series, too. You know, he's he's not a player at that point in time. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. He was super cool. And one of the things I was nervous about with the book was just, you know, God, this guy has this amazing uh, rep. And I knew that there was a baseline of coolness that, you know, I had to make sure that that we – that, that he helped, lived up to that. And boy, did he live up to it. And and the book is just, I, I still love to read it. And I I, I feel weird because I, I hear from other writers and they're nervous and I don't know if it's good enough and this and that. And I don't know if I'm just, and, and they have imposter you know, syndrome or whatever. And I just felt through this thing. It was so easy. We would talk. I would talk to his teammates. I got all the information. We did a ton of uh, archive search uh, searches on newspaper.com newspapers.com we did a lot of homework and i just felt down the line this is going to be a great book and i i I had supreme confidence much like the cobra had supreme confidence at the plate in the right field that uh that we were gonna have a winner on our hands well when you got a great subject matter like you did for that book it's it's hard to to go wrong on it and then especially him him helping you and the pirates organization helping you and all the the modern technologies and the internet and newspapers.coms of the world it's yeah. a, a great thing. So uh, very, very looking forward to, to getting my hands on a copy of this book and, and reading it. And I'm sure the listeners are too. And uh, we thank you, Dave, for, for joining us today to talk about this great book and this great player from baseball history, Dave Parker. So thank you, sir. Darren, thanks for having me on. It was a blast. Sorry, but my pitching coach just called timeout and he's coming out to the mound. I think I'm going to get yanked for a reliever. We'll see you back tomorrow for some more great sports history on Sports Jersey Dispatch Podcast. We invite you to check out our websites, jerseydispatch.com and pigskindispatch.com. Not only see the daily sports history, but to experience the preservation of great events and people that play the games. Find us on Pigskin Dispatch. It's also on social media outlets of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel. Get all your daily sports history. Pigskin Dispatch is happy to be associated with the Sports History Network, the sports headquarters of yesteryear, found at sportshistorynetwork.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com.
Hi, this is Joe Ziemba, the host of When Football Was Football, here on the Sports History Network. I'm very pleased to announce that I will be partnering with the Sports History Network to give away two copies of my latest book called Bears vs. Cardinals, the NFL's Oldest Rivalry. To enter, just head over to the following link, sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash giveaways. We hope you'll enjoy the numerous stories in the book, which is largely based on the newly released Dutch Sternemann collection at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Dutch was the co-owner of the early Chicago Bears with George Hallis and kept correspondence, financial records, and scouting reports, which now allow us to peek into the management of an NFL club during the first few years of the league's existence. Along the way, we'll meet unusual gridiron characters from years gone by, including a quarterback who could throw the ball farther behind his back than he could throwing it forward, a Bears lineman who was such a good tavern fighter that he decided to enter the boxing universe, and a Cardinals halfback who gave up the NFL rushing title by deciding to not show up for his team's final game of the season. And can we forget the time the Al Capone mob interrupted a Bears-Cardinals game? The new book was fun to research, and I hope you'll enter our free contest today. Once the winners are selected, we'll be in touch regarding shipping as well as to inscribe the book personally for you. This might make a perfect gift for Mother's or Father's Day or simply add it to your own personal collection. Once again, enter by visiting sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash giveaways. Thank you and good luck.